The following program is a presentation of the Interfaith Broadcasting Commission. I just fear I, I'm not going to make it. I fear that um, it's too big uh, an obstacle to, be, to overcome. Jerome Lawrence, like 45 million Americans, lives with a mental illness. Even though I had taken meds for about maybe nine years, I didn't feel I was in recovery till I started feeling like I wanted to get up and do something and be somebody. Jerome is one of many speaking about the heartache. Medicine helps, but it doesn't take away the illness. I struggle through life, and, and it, it, it is a struggle. But Jerome has found hope and courage to work through the daily issues that confront anyone dealing with these illnesses. I was on the bridge and I was gonna jump in, you know, cause it was a river, see? And there's a lot of river currents and a lot of, you know, and I was gonna do it. People don't understand when you say, I have a mental illness, what is it? I remember I was hungry and it was cold. And I remember having to choose between two garbage cans of what I was going to sleep in. The only person that knew about my hospitalization for two years was my senior pastor. I thought it would embarrass my family. I thought it would embarrass myself. You know, to have an illness, especially this kind, people just look at you different. I was hiding. I was running from the stigma, uh, the shame of being mentally ill. There's a lot of stigma that I know that people with an illness or looked down upon. There's something about having mental illness where everything falls away and what you experience is fear and isolation. The story of mental illness in the U.S. has been one tainted by stigma and ignorance. Well, the stigma goes back to the time when we knew nothing about the brain. Nobody knew how to treat it, and what we did or what people did back then was just hide people, put them out of, just out of sight. I was sent to Boston State Hospital, and, and this is before the... Uh, so-called reforms of the 70s, and uh, this place was a, a pit, you know, just a hellhole. It was pretty grim, you know, large numbers of people and very few professional people taking care of them. We had to go and, and clean this building that literally had men in cages who were naked and they would, you know, urinate over you while you were doing this. It was not always as sensitive to the needs of people as one might expect. I was only about nine, and I was put with a bunch of adults, and I was literally scared to death. For many years, state hospitals provided institutions to essentially keep those with mental illness segregated from the rest of the population. No one believed they could function normally in society. During World War II, conscientious objectors who served in the nation's mental hospitals uncovered abusive treatment of the ill. During the 1960s, there was a movement to deinstitutionalize state hospitals and set up community programs. Penn Foundation in Souderton, Pennsylvania was one such program. There was a movement uh, to, to find a better way of doing it, and that better way was offering treatment within the community. Um, and I think that that was one of the main reasons that Penn Foundation was established to offer psychiatric services here in this community. When somebody told me I had a mental illness, I didn't know what a mental illness was, but I had it. Wanda Lindsay serves on the board at Penn Foundation and talks to groups about her experience with mental illness. In the moderate program, when I was in there, I went to the window and I said, God, is this all there is? Am I always going to be taking medication, eating TV dinners, rocking on a rocking chair, watching TV? Isn't there ever going to be more to my life again? Community programs focus on training psychiatric doctors to manage treatment differently. We need to redesign our whole mental health system because for the last hundred years it was designed to help people uh, who are going to deteriorate. Now we need a mental health system that facilitates folks who are going to recover. Wanda enjoys having her own apartment, job, and feeling like an important part of her community. There's four things that have helped in my recovery, and that is, number one, trust. I needed to trust the foundation, that they knew what a mental illness was, 
and they were going to help me get better, and they were going to explain it to me. And number two was my friends and family support, and number three is me wanting to get better, and number four, most of all, is my faith in God. Even with the move to locally-based services, the psychiatric community tended to isolate persons from their families. Dr. Joyce Berland works in the family program for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Families have been really hideously stigmatized. We were the people that were the folks that were going to be held responsible for the outcomes of our children, and when the outcome was schizophrenia or bipolar illness, it, we, we were deemed to be, you know, the crucial factors in their illness. And that, that persisted in my own history when my sister became ill in 1960. That was the reigning paradigm of how people looked at mental illness. And my parents were, were simply warded off. The, the, the goal of therapy in those days was to separate the client from the wounding family. You know, we need a parasol like that. And I went through the same thing with my own daughter when she got sick in 1980, is that paradigm was still in place. And I remember the first psychiatrist I met had sat me down in the middle of the night when we had just come in from a horrific episode, and we'd finally gotten her in the hospital. And uh, he, you know, talked to me very seriously about the fact that she had an infant neurosis uh, that was breaking through again at the age of 19 and that uh, it came from our dislocation as mother and child and I remember sitting there as tired as I was and exhausted as I was and I said this is absolute poppycock I remember the times that I would be home and I'm still in bed and it's two or three o'clock in the afternoon and my wife's family would come over and they'd say, what's wrong with Ray? And I could hear her kind of giving them excuses and not knowing. I don't know what's wrong with me. I want to be successful. I want to hold down a job. Ray Guevara also works for NAMI as director of a technical assistance program. I had started abusing drugs and alcohol at 10, 11 years old to self-medicate, got in a lot of trouble, became a ward of the court, was out on the streets, was homeless. And at 26 years old, I had gotten clean and sober, and I had about six years of not drinking drug or using drugs. Um, but yet I still couldn't hold down a job longer than two months, and I still couldn't do all the other things that, I mean, most people want to do. I mean, I get to the place where I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't shower. Uh, I couldn't, I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't take care of myself. And then all of a sudden, I'd go through these cycles where I had all this energy and I was going to land a job and I'd stay up all night and I really understood what I was going to do with the rest of my life and, you know, go out and put in applications. And then I'd go through these periods again where I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I kept losing jobs. I remember reading an article on bipolar disorder and I so related to the author that I thought, well, you know, maybe this is it. When I was diagnosed, to me, the idea, even that small of a dream, the idea that I'd ever be able to work again or that I could ever provide for my family, um, that we were going to be cursed to living in poverty the rest of our lives, it seemed very real, especially because I didn't know anything about mental health. My education of mental illness up to that point was the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That was it. You wouldn't have lost your There's only typically one kind of mental illness portrayed on, on regular old TV or movies, and that's the person who typically has untreated psychosis. You I ain't no little kid where you're going to have cigarettes kept for me like cookies, and I want something dead. Take that right there. That's right now. I had seen all these movies, you know, and people with mental illness, they were crazy. They were labeled... You know, they were the people punching their hands through windows and jumping off buildings. On the news, I would challenge anybody to turn on the news and not hear a derogatory reference to somebody with mental illness. Well, the media has a tremendous influence on people's um, opinion about mental illness and people with mental illnesses. And you see so much violence and, and this, uh, this mentally ill person did this and so forth. Any kind of crime that happens, if the person's on medication, they say, you know, mentally ill person. They wouldn't do that if they were diabetic. If, if somebody was diabetic and they committed a crime, they wouldn't say a diabetic person. 
Mental ill people are more often victims of violence than they are violent. I think it's sensationalization, um, how other people feel. This is why I feel so strongly about stigma efforts. We now have the capacity to treat people with mental disorders and return them to productive lives and positive relationships. On the other hand, uh, the bad news was that less than 50% of the people who suffer a mental disorder even seek treatment, or in great part because of the great stigma that surrounds mental illness in this country. Ray joined the fight against stigma even as he struggled with his illness. I just remember praying and thinking, okay, God, I'm gonna try to put my best foot forward and have faith um, and, and, and not give up hope and, you know, get to a place where even if it means that I'll never work again, at least I can get to that place where I can feel good about me and know that I'm a child of God, you know, no matter what. And, and I don't know why I went through all this stuff, but maybe I can make use of it. Ray made use of this knowledge by telling his story in a NAMI educational program called In Our Own Voice. As I started volunteering and sharing my story and seeing the effect it had on other people, I started feeling pretty good about myself. I started feeling like, hey, you know what? Uh, it's okay. I really, it really got okay. This illness does not encapsulate who and what I am and what I could be. I think the other aspect of stigma, which I really think is discrimination, is how you might feel. Um, and that's hard. It's tough. First of all, I am standing up. <laughs> and I started kind of going all over the country sharing my story. So people were getting to hear some of what I kind of I had learned of the effects of uh, people hearing firsthand that people can and do recover. When people with severe mental illnesses get out and interact with society, they're the best at reducing discrimination and prejudice because they look so normal. You know, they look so normal. They don't look like the stereotype movie figure or book figure uh, that most of society has been exposed to. Even when I wasn't working, at least I was volunteering, I was doing something, I was pouring coffee, I was getting out of myself. That has been one of the most healing aspects of my recovery. Sharing my story is a part of getting out of myself. It almost normalized it after a while where I said, you know what, it really is okay. I don't have a problem with, with, with having a mental illness. You know, if you have a problem with that, I'm sorry, but I'm okay. The deinstitutionalization movement occurred uh, around the 60s, 1960s. Uh, it kind of coincided with the civil rights movement, if you will, and for all the right reasons. Risden Slade is a professor of criminal justice. I mean, there were some terrible abuses that were taking place in state hospitals, and the idea was to move people from state hospitals and to link them to treatment in the community. Uh, unfortunately, what has often happened is the linkage to treatment in the community, for whatever reason, has not followed. Where has some of this shift been going? Well, some of it has been going to jails and prisons. The largest inpatient psychiatric facility in the United States is said to be the Los Angeles County Jail. Second largest, Rikers Island Jail, New York City. More people with mental illness in those institutions than in any state hospital in the United States. At this point, there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 400,000 people in our jails and prisons in this country who have mental illness. Uh, in addition, uh, they're probably double that on parole or probation. People in the criminal justice system often had no choice. They had to deal with the mentally ill because nobody else was dealing with them. And so if they were not prepared to do it, what do you expect is going to happen? It's not going to be good. And often in this country, it's not good. If you're not taking your medicine or if you don't have a way to get medicine, well, it's kind of hard to get to places on time. It's kind of hard to get a job. It's kind of hard to keep a place to live. And if you can't do those things, you can't succeed on parole or probation. So you go back, and the whole thing starts again. Risden conducts training to help officers know how to deal with persons in crisis situations. Uh, my first experience with this is uh, when I became uh, symptomatic was while uh, I was in training to be a federal probation officer. I'd go into training in Miami. And uh, a hotel manager there uh, felt that I was trespassing uh, at the hotel. And so uh, what happened, the police were called. Uh, they, in turn, uh, took me to a uh, hospital setting. I was ultimately placed in four-point restraints there. 
and they agreed to release me if I would seek treatment back in my home state. Risden found a doctor who accurately diagnosed his illness and offered him hope. He said, you know what? He said, I get my jollies. He said, I get my kicks by taking people like you and putting you back together again so that you can move forth and be a success in life. He said, now, you may not be a federal probation officer again. He said, but so what? Who wants to be a federal probation officer? When Risden moved to another state, his new psychiatrist discontinued his medication. He soon found himself in police custody again. My wife is there when the police arrive, and she said, here's the vial of medication that he should be on. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in criminal justice. He was uh, administrative assistant to the warden at Central Correctional Institution in this town. He was a federal probation officer in this town. Please help him and get him to treatment. Well, the officers, they took me immediately to jail. They didn't bother to tell the booking agent at the jail that uh, I was mentally ill and that I was symptomatic. The jailers did not know how to handle his illness. And they had belly chains the whole nine yards. And the next time I remember anything, I ended up in a strip cell, which is basically a cell uh, with a hole in the floor for bodily functions, and that's it. Never offered me any medical treatment, nothing, while I was in the jail. Eventually, he was released to the custody of a probation officer friend. They literally told him they had no clue what to do to me, how to handle me, none whatsoever. And the bottom line is, what am I doing in their jail if they don't know how to handle me, if they don't know how to offer me appropriate treatment? And what I'm about is trying to make sure that this doesn't happen to other people who don't have the contacts, who don't have the resources. I want you after today to be able to look them in the eye and say, you know, recovery is possible. And I'll call the counselor. I think we need to train the gamut of people who are, are dealing with individuals who are mentally ill. And we can't take all of the blame and shift it on the criminal justice system either. There's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, the mental health system and insurance regulations, Medicare reform, uh, things of this nature all contribute to this recycling of people with mental illness through the criminal justice system. It used to be thought that people with severe mental illnesses would continue to uh, deteriorate, would have acute exacerbations or episodes, but over time uh, they would get worse. So the mental health system was designed to prevent this deterioration, to take care of folks, to, uh, and really to take care of society by segregating the folks from society. As an Army psychologist, Dr. William Anthony observed that the treatment given psychiatric patients offered little hope. People with the physical disabilities, the neurological disabilities, were getting a lot of rehab and meetings and involvement and so forth. And the soldiers who had come back from Vietnam with a psychiatric disorder uh, we're getting medication and maybe a little OT or something like that, but no real heavy involvement, and I thought uh, good help. So it was this disparity between what people with physical disability were getting, what people with, at the time, were called mentally ill, not psychiatrically disabled. That disparity uh, caused me to say we need to do something more with people with uh, mental illness. We need to develop rehab programs for people with mental illness, and that's what we've done. Dr. Anthony started the psychiatric rehab program at Boston University. Here, Lynn Legier found new hope for her lifelong struggle with mental illness. I, I tried to kill myself when I was eight, and um, I turned to drugs and alcohol. I remember um, the first day I took drugs, and they were actually from my mother's medicine cabinet. And uh, I took that drug, and I went to school, and it was like nirvana. You know, oh my God, did I love that. I felt good about myself. Within about a year, I was a full-blown heroin addict. Ironically, I think that my early drug use sort of saved me um, because I was always depressed, but I think that there was just, I got enough relief from it that I wasn't as desperate. Lynn went into drug rehab to escape a drug dealer threatening her life. In rehab, she stopped using drugs. I drank for another 10 years, and those 10 years I was in and out of hospitals all the time. 
um, incredibly suicidal during all that time. What I didn't understand was that, that alcohol was just making my mental illness worse. At first she was crushed to discover her newfound sobriety didn't make her depression disappear. I still get symptoms. Um, I still, you know, have times that I go into depressions, but whoa, I'm so much better, you know, and that is the recovery process. When deinstitutionalization came along, uh, we opened the doors of the hospital and we gave people uh, a prescription for their medicine when they left. Now recovery is very different. Now we have to open the doors of the community and help people develop a prescription for their lives. We're working with people and they have a whole life, you know, they have a spiritual life and an emotional life and a physical life and a social life and what can we do to support um, growth and development in those areas. Boston University's program develops recovery models and trains others around the world in the use of their methods. Everyone has a different way of recovering, but I think we can say there are certain principles that would help people along the way. Uh, and these are principles and ideas that we get from the people with mental illnesses who have said, you know, what was most helpful to me was a person who believed in me, who supported me, who affirmed me as a person. Over the last 20 years, we've provided educational programs that teach people skills and provide people supports so that they can move on in their lives and live beyond the illness. In all those years in the system, I had never heard about rehab. The medical system just does not bring in the rehab, which is so sad because they're so complementary. It's like the medical can work with symptoms and the, the medical part of it, and then rehab talks about, and what do you want to do in your life? Talk about choosing the goal. This is the second, <laughs> third phase of my PR, and I just... The idea that a person with mental illness should have choices in their goals for treatment can make a big difference in outcome. My life would be great if... In Rock Valley, Iowa, a program called Hope Haven has incorporated this into their rehabilitation process. And Carrie Broadway went through this program. I did different things when I was a child, you know. I would want to die and I'd try to suffocate myself under the pillows, hoping that someone would notice that something was wrong. And um, I struggled with anorexia in junior high and into high school. Carrie's condition worsened during her freshman year of college. A counselor suggested she explore hospitalization. I didn't want to be labeled that right away my freshman year, but he convinced me to go in. Her situation stabilized, and she returned to school. I made it through the year, still struggling, though, a lot of racing thoughts. I did a lot of um, the self-mutilation behaviors. Um, I used to wear long sleeves 365 days a year, even when it was... 105 degrees outside, you know, I had long sleeves on to cover the track marks from razor blades and curling irons on my arms and on my stomach. Finally, in March of my sophomore year, I overdosed on medications and um, was found in the music building where I had been practicing piano and was rushed to the emergency room, which then took me to the psych hospital in Sioux Falls. And um, I, I was devastated. For all reasons, in my mind, I wanted to be dead. I didn't want to deal with this anymore. I felt I felt I was a burden to my family, you know, burdens to other people because I wasn't able to function on my own. People have had a life. They come to a crisis situation. Uh, stabilization is necessary. And then they need to look at, how do I rebuild that life? I came to Hope Haven as a client in their group home and started participating in the day treatment program and eventually the intensive psych rehab program where I worked to meet goals of living, which was living in my own apartment, which I did about nine months later. Intensive Psychiatric Rehabilitation, or IPR, offers practical classes in job skills, budgeting, communicating, keeping an apartment, stress management, and wellness. Participants begin to see new opportunities for their lives. Carrie went on to work at one of Hope Haven's programs. I feel useful. I feel like I needed. You know, I'm not just working as a client at minimum wage that they found a job for me. It's that I'm actually hired based on my own um, skills, based on my own 
recommendations. Intensive psychiatric rehabilitation is expected to be a time-limited program of immersing the person in the rehabilitation process and expecting the person to spend um, somewhere between four and ten hours a week with us and then moving on to developing community supports and the skills that are necessary for them to live so that they are no longer needing our services. Vani Williamson also has participated in Hope Haven's IPR courses. I've been in therapy for quite a long time, and when I got in readiness development in IPR, that's when I started really realizing that I did have an inside to me, and I had to get in touch with it, my inner child, and get in touch with that. And that was hard to do, because I was taught all those years not to show anything. One of Vani's longtime dreams was to study clowning. In IPR, she was encouraged to pursue it. I love clowns. I always have. I would go to the Shrine Circus just to see the clowns. They make people laugh. They, you know, they have real emotions, you know, and they really show their emotions, you know. Unlike Vaughn. Like if I'm having a down day and my depression gets the best of me, I go and get her bring her out, and then go around to the neighborhood and make people laugh. And then in return, it makes me laugh and smile and feel good. And it's really neat that I personally can hide behind her because at times I don't feel happy and glowy and all that. And I get her on and I feel much better about stuff. For Mark Spear, IPR was a lifesaver. There's really three components of why I'm still alive today. And uh, that's the medication, my mother, and IPR. Mark had worked as an architect and interior designer in northern Minnesota for over 20 years when his life fell apart. You know, I had my mask on, and I've been wearing that mask for... 40 some years. As time went on, you know, you just, you get, you get stronger. Having found hope for his own life in the intensive psychiatric rehabilitation program, Mark now offers peer support to others. It's like there's somebody there, and somebody that cares about you and whatever, and somebody that's prodding you along. There's a whole team. Every person that we work with has a whole team. You can't deal with a mental illness until you realize that you have one and accept that you have one and then accept that you need the help to get through it. Something that's been important to me all my life is my education. And I've been able to expand upon that while working on at Hope Haven, learn about disabilities, learn about mental retardation, um, learn about how to interact with people with disabilities. It's just been in the last probably year and a half that I actually started looking at going back to school and now I'm actually I'm planning to go back in the fall and study um, pre-medicine and then go hopefully to the University of Iowa to study psychiatry. I can't say I don't get disappointed that I didn't finish college and graduate in 2000 but it gives me a new hope. The message of recovery is a message that occurs on many levels. And the most important message that that communicates is hopefulness. During my, my last big crash in 98, my therapist would try to support me to go forward. And, and I would say to her, you know, I know I can get up again. I don't know that I can live through another crash. I just don't know if I can do it again to set my heart on hope and then have it extinguished. And she was able to hold the hope until I could begin the process and then facilitate it. Hope is a, is a great antidote uh, to all sorts of ills. And I think um, it also communicates a message of empowerment to consumers and family members, that this is not a hole from which I can't get out of. This is not a death sentence. Um, this is an illness, a challenge uh, that I have to meet, and I'm going to have to work hard at. But there is hope at the other end. I'm going to get my master's degree with a very high level of achievement in my department. Um, I've started a program in disability services, you know, um, 
And I am a person who, if people heard my history, would never be able to put the two together. You know, it'd be like there's this person and there's this person and never do the two meet. And I guess the, the biggest thing I want to say to people is that they do meet, that recovery happens and that we need to support recovery. People are people. And people with mental illnesses are people first, long before their diagnoses, long before their labels, long before their patterns of symptoms emerge. They're people, and they're going to be people long after they recover. Next, we'll look at how others work through the confusing tangle of health insurance needs and how faith groups extend help and hope. Why is health insurance for mental illness such an issue? I don't get any benefits now. I don't get Social Security, I don't get Medicaid, I don't get Medicare. I can't get insurance through the company that I work for because it doesn't cover mental illness. And if I take any insurance, even if it doesn't cover mental illness, I can't get my medication program where the pharmaceutical company approves and, and sends medication to my doctor. If I get insurance so that physically I can be okay, then I can't get help mentally. I'm a psychologist by training, but I always like to look at culture and see what accounts for much of what we experience as human beings. And we do not have a social contract on mental illness. Society makes contracts around things that they have to do, which means everybody having a part in solving the problem understands that it must be done and resources must be allocated. And we are going to look for results that involve cure and, and containment of the illness and prevention of the illness. Persons with mental illness often need advocates as they find their way through many different systems. When I was working full time and Andy was um, under 18, so he was a minor, and he was on pretty strong meds at that point. I got a call from the insurance company at the office one day telling me, this woman said, Mrs. Herbo, We've determined that your son, Andy, no longer needs these meds. I just laughed and said, ah, you got to be kidding. Who are you? <laughs> are you a medical person? No. I said, listen, my son's diagnosis is bipolar. That's a lifelong disability. You don't heal from bipolar disability or schizophrenia. Well, we've determined that I said, uh-uh, no, I will not accept this. You cannot do this. And for some reason, they didn't. The treatment patterns for mental illness aren't as straightforward as they are for other illnesses. And sometimes insurance companies worry that the amount of treatment given will be exactly the amount that's allowed. We have effective treatments available. We have a lot of people who need these treatments. And unfortunately, they can't get them often for a, a financial barrier. What would really begin to, to knock down walls, I think, in terms of stigma would be um, this whole issue regarding parity. Uh, and if mental health were covered on par, insurance-wise, as physical health is. If insurance covered mental illness, the stigma would go away. I mean, almost immediately, <laughs> if it would legitimize mental illnesses. There is a considerable body of knowledge now that tells us that even full, uh, robust parity will probably cost less than one to four percent uh, to implement nationwide. The McDonnell Douglas study, where for every dollar spent in mental health, they save four dollars on their projections in medical care, in absenteeism, and in productivity. Studies have shown, and, and we've done our own studies on this, that people who have existing mental illness will tend on average to have about three and a half times the amount of claims in a given year as people who don't have mental illnesses. Of that three and a half times, only about a third of it is to treat the mental illness itself. The other amount is to treat accompanying or different types of illnesses that the person has, often as a result of the mental illness. We've developed enough data to know that um, when mental illnesses are covered, over uh, the first few years, 
the um, expense goes up a little bit to businesses who are covering the employees and stuff. We offered a product to our small employers that had an increased benefit for mental illness. And unfortunately, uh, employers were not interested in that. They were interested in the product that had a lower price and had a more stringent benefit on mental illness. Over uh, three, just three or four years, the total health care costs come down because so many people who are suffering from depression or anxi have anxiety disorders, that kind of thing, keep going to the doctor because something's wrong and they don't get help. So they access health care. And if they can have their depression or other illness um, treated, then the whole health care costs will come down. What everyone fears is that the amount of treatment would escalate dramatically. And because it's more difficult to discern what appropriate treatment is for a mental health illness, say compared to a cancer treatment, uh, the worry would be that the utilization would increase dramatically and maybe inappropriately dramatically for some people. Pat Bradley had to quit a job because it paid too much for her to continue on SSI but didn't offer private insurance. Because I made too much money and I couldn't get health insurance through them, they said I had to wait two years and only be partial. And I needed more than that. There are a lot of rules and you better follow them. <laughs> it's important not to have too much income, you know if you're on a certain type of disability. Another issue is moving to regular employment after you've been on disability because you frequently lose the health care benefit. It's hard once you're in the system to get out. You really can't win. It's no, it's no win situation. Our system is extremely fragmented. We do not have a mental health system. We have dozens and dozens of mental health systems. We have public mental health systems. We have private mental health systems. We have public-private where the boundaries are blurred. We have states. We have local communities. The system wants to keep you as you are. They, they want you to work. They, they encourage it. But then, you're, then, the, then they come right back at you. And then you lose everything. While some find themselves trapped in cumbersome systems, others are finding ways to cope. I have a really good friend, for instance, Jerome Lawrence, who um, developed uh, schizophrenia when he was um, a senior in college. I wanted to get help for my illness, so I went to the doctor and they said in order for me to get help, I had to sign myself in. Well, I thought I'll sign myself in, I'll get a nice bed, they'll treat me. Well, I signed myself in and they locked the doors behind me and wouldn't let me out. And I wanted to sign myself out, but they said it doesn't work like that. But he came involved in an arts program at the Episcopal Church here in Atlanta. This was the start of Jerome's recovery. I've seen so many artists paint things that were anguished and tortured. And, uh, and you can tell in the work by the, the slashing of the brush strokes and the dark colors that uh, they were going through some kind of turmoil. And I was like that for a time in college, but now I'm more relaxed. I paint a friendlier type of art. As Jerome's recovery progressed, he envisioned more than a life dependent on supplemental security income. And now he's worked himself off of SSI and is making a living selling his paintings and working for an advocacy organization. In today's society, the, you, you are what you your worth. If you can do an amount of work, then you're va you have value to society. But if you're incapable of work, it sort of sets you off, off to the side and say, well, you can't participate. We'll give you a little money and you just sit. I started to see that I had something of value that I could use in society and contribute. And I started selling my work and I started taking, I started a plan to achieve self-support. That's something that SSI um, allows you to, to start, whereby you set aside part of your income that's not counted when they judge your eligibility to receive Medicaid and Medicare. And that's really what all I needed because I could do the art. And when the plan is over, they stop your SSI and, and you only have a short time left on Medicaid. So you have to be able to 
to support yourself, you have to pay for your own health care. And that's a big jump. Though I'm not considered disabled by Social Security rules, I still live with the illness. The medicine helps, but it doesn't take away the illness. I struggle through life, and, and it, it, it is a struggle. It's, it's a struggle because sometimes you're not, you don't feel well. You start misunderstanding things. You're likely to get into arguments. Uh, things sort of, snow, sort of snowball. I'm not recovered, uh, but I'm still in recovery because I am not to a point where I am happy with my state of mind and my position in the world, my the level I am in, in, in society. Uh, I'm working to achieve more. Now we, we know that people with severe mental illnesses can improve, can get better over the long term. The majority of people with severe mental illnesses will. So we need to redesign our whole mental health system. If you help people get back into life and, and to have a job and to go back to school and to live out in the community and to have friendships and families that, um, you know, they're not going to be taxing the health care system as much and they're not going to be taxing the Social Security system. Just think in public health how many social contracts we have around giving kids the kind of, you know, shots that they need when they're youngsters and but everybody runs away from mental illness. It is, we have never as a, as a society sat down and said this must be a priority in human effort. Faith communities have done a very good job of reaching out and, and providing help and care for persons with addictions, for homelessness, AIDS, a lot of different things that our society is going through. But mental illness is often at the root of many of those things. When I was doing homeless outreach, I'd go into the bridge and, hey, where'd you get that uh, sleeping bag? Oh, the church came by. I have a mentally ill son. Uh, I'm a lot more experienced. And I think one of the reasons that clergy shy away from mental illness is the fact that they are uneducated in this aspect. Most seminaries do not teach anything about mental illness. So there's a fear factor. We believe it's very important for people who are trained to be ministers or trained to recognize mental disorders as early as possible, but also are trained to know that there is a network, if you will, in which one can, can get quality care. I started educating the local churches and they were wanting to know, where do I send someone in my parish or someone in my church community for help? And a lot of times they don't know. And so kind of providing that referral, I think there needs to be a bridge cross, you know, a bridge uh, connecting the faith community with the mental health community. Generally speaking, it's been a pretty hostile relationship. Clergy have a term for people that are mentally ill, and that's high maintenance. I know I've talked to pastors, and some of them have maybe one counseling course in seminary, so some really feel in over their head when they're, they're faced with situations like that. Crown Center for Counseling is a Christian-based counseling center that has a church partnership program. Pastors are the first people, they're the first line of defense for, for people who need counseling. And I think they do a very good job in most situations and can handle most problems. When you get to certain areas of depression that might become more complicated or some of these other issues, then they know they're gonna to have to have some um, added resources, so that's where we like to come in. They provide vouchers to pastors to give to those who have trouble paying for counseling. Initially, we were trying to come up with a concept of how to provide for the needs of people who didn't have insurance or to provide an alternative. A pastor can refer somebody, it doesn't even have to be a member of their congregation, it could be someone from their community that's come to him for help. Um, he refers the client here. These folks would get a reduced rate in having a contract with the church about how the billing would be taken care of here. They have a, a voucher that he, they sign and they agree between the church and them how much the client pays and how much they pay. 
And again, like I said, we encourage the client to be responsible for a por portion of that. And they also say how many sessions because we don't, we don't expect them to sign a blank check. So at the end of that time, if we feel like they need more time, more sessions, we'll go back and ask for more. But that's been a very effective um, program for the churches who have used it, have usually used it more than once. We have a lot of work to do with the faith-based community. And the reason that's so vital is because most people go to their communities of faith for help when they're in crisis. I don't know too many people that'll go to a mental health clinic. They go to their pastor. They go to their community center. So it's extremely important that we get uh, the faith community on board. Because of the fear, the stigma, and the shame that is still often associated with mental illness, many of our faith communities avoid talking about it. They don't know how to talk about it. And many do still perceive it as a moral or a spiritual failure. And then if you would just get your act together, if you'd pray a little harder and, and j snap out of it, that you would be okay, and they don't understand that it is an illness like any other illness. Susan Gregg Schroeder was a United Methodist minister when she became ill with major depression. I had a, a very much a low, low self-worth. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't concentrate. It was very difficult for me to perform my duties, and I'd come home and isolate a lot. Uh, I was very emotional, cried a lot. And, uh, and I had thoughts of suicide, and that was very frightening to me because they came out of nowhere. Despite all of my pastoral counseling classes and seminary, I really had no idea what was happening to me. I was overcome with um, despair and had no idea what was happening to me. It was, I was referred to a psychiatrist who happened to be a member of my congregation, which was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. He recommended hospitalization as I was a danger to myself. I was silent about that. The only person that knew about my hospitalization for two years was my senior pastor. We kept it a secret from the congregation. A lot of that was fear of losing my job, of, of what would happen. Eventually, Susan decided to be open about her illness. There were some elements of the church that wanted to put me on involuntary disability. It was my senior pastor who believed in me, who stood up for me. I wrote a letter to the congregation called The Burden of Silence. And my pastor, senior pastor, wrote an accompanying letter. Three days later, the parish nurse, Jean Wright Elson, had a meeting about what depression was all about, with, led by a professional. Expecting a small group, she had a turnaway crowd of 133 people. Well, seeing such a need, we ended up starting a support group led by a professional at our church. Never, never dreamed, but the, that's why the Olympic thing. Susan also founded an organization called Mental Health Ministries, which educates people in faith communities on mental health issues. In fact, I'm low on some different ones. Susan identified kind of personal mission for herself, which was to remove the stigma of mental illness in the faith communities. And as she took on that mission several years ago, she was very surprised, and I was very surprised, to see how that evolved. We did a lot of work starting then, speaking out uh, about mental illness, writing articles, speaking to groups, and that really led to me writing my book, uh, Gifts of the Shadow, and talking about my own story. So I see that as a turning point of speaking out and realizing what a need there was out there, not just among the people sitting in the pews, but among my peers, among the clergy. Her role was more to be an educator and to use her story and her insights uh, to help educate clergy and others about mental illness and educate them about what faith communities can do to address mental illness. There's unfortunately a significant number of our churches that still see mental illness as a result of a moral or spiritual failure. Uh, some churches, unfortunately, see it as having to do with demon possession. Uh, people are encouraged to stop taking their medication. 
often with disastrous results. It can be devastating because instead of wanting to work towards health and wholeness and recovery, they're busy blaming themselves. In the beginning, I felt that God was abandoning me. I felt he had left totally. You know, why was he allowing all this bad stuff to happen to me? What did I have to do? I guess the thought was, what did I have to do to get back on his good side? And that's kind of how the church portrayed it to me as well. I got very involved in one church, and I remember the pastor at one point sitting there and telling me, well, if you really have faith in God, you don't have to take medication. And I remember the feeling of, it was almost like somehow I'm cheating and I don't have enough faith in God because I'm taking medication. I think education is where we have to start with it. Helping congregations not to be afraid to look at mental illness and deal with it realistically, that it's not an evil, that it's not a result of sin, but it is usually or frequently neurochemical and that we need to educate congregations to understand what mental illness is and the impact it has on families and friends as well as on the individual himself or herself. The role of a friend or family member is often difficult in the wake of a mental illness. As I deal and, and live with and love the families that we work with, what I see is valor. I mean, this huge effort of families kind of picking up this broken system and trying to plug in where they can. We are the shadow mental health system in America, unheralded and unsung. It's part of our culture to look at mental illness as if it is either the fault of the family or a parent. And then sadly, it's also looked at as if it were the fault of the person who has it. Well, my family was educated and, and it was explained to them you know, this is what's going on with Ray, and they realized it wasn't their fault, it wasn't my fault, that this in fact was an illness. That really served as a catalyst for my recovery, and we could get to the point where we were on the same side. Before that, it felt like it was me against them. For many of us who've had many other illnesses, it is quite a shock after someone in the family has come through cancer and all the kind of support and help and education you get around that to have a family member who's mentally ill and gets practically nothing. People do not come and visit. They do not send flowers. They do not send cards. They do not send other things that they would, uh, tokens of support that they would if you had a physical illness. Only illness in the world where you never get a covered dish. Some people feel like they can't be of help, they're not worthy of helping because they don't have a psychology degree or they're not a therapist or whatever. For Debbie Miller, support was as simple as a quiet place to go. Joy is a person whom I've gone to when I just needed somewhere to go. I didn't feel safe being by myself at home. I just thought it would be nice if she could have a place that she could just come to, you know, if she wanted to get away and just have a place where relatively quiet, and be outside or inside or walk. But I didn't necessarily need to spill all my guts of what was going on. I just needed to be there. I think the first time I came over and just walked a couple times, it was more comfortable, but that time that I called you in the evening, yeah. came over at night, you was that more awkward? You fairly stressed that time. Yeah. It was probably one of those times where maybe it wasn't the easiest time for you that late in the right. evening. Yeah, I don't think that necessarily was a problem. Probably more, I wasn't real sure what was going to be expected of me in yeah, terms and what of, I would say. of being able to help her. I think I felt a little more stressed about that, probably. I, I think people in congregations sell themselves short yeah. of how much of an impact they're able to have. Our responsibility as helpers is to help the person with the disability or with the illness. And then to help the family uh, understand what's going on and support what's going on, stick by the person, et cetera. So many times people with mental illnesses have said, you know, it was so important that my family tried to help even though they didn't know what to do. It started off that he wanted to fix me. He wanted everything to be back to the way it was. I know exactly what needs to be done. You need to take your medicine, or you need to go for a walk with me, or drive you know, to the park with me. That was difficult for him to just be with me. I had to learn very quickly that 
it ultimately is Susan's choice. I can listen to what is needful, I can encourage her, I can support her, but ultimately she has to take the step. That relationship kind of evolved as, as he understood my illness more and I understood my illness more. So much of uh, learning about caring for a spouse is understanding what's happening with the spouse, is communicating with the spouse. He still puts all my little pills in the right boxes and orders my medications and it is really something that I think he can do. As she, that kind of protection and caregiving changes and she begins to come out of the depression, I need to change my role. I need to be uh, a spouse, get back to my spouse role. And getting back to my spouse role, really, it was very helpful to have a counselor to work with both of us in terms of the fact that we could disagree on something and it wouldn't send her into a deep depression. And we could argue in a healthy way and communicate in a healthy way. Um, and it wasn't just about uh, protecting her, but it was about both of us strengthening our relationship and growing together, um, having been through this pretty deep journey into the darkness and then coming out of that. You look very nice. If we're really about helping people recover, we'll develop relationships with people, we'll teach them the skills they need, we'll provide them the supports they need to make it. But the recovery comes from the person with mental illness. That's who's doing the heavy lifting. I think that is what my recovery is, is understanding the world and how I fit in it and generally how to solve problems, how to solve my own problems. Growth happens and recovery happens and it's never too late. It's just never too late, you know. Um, there's always hope out there. And I've been up on the hill, I've talked to some members of Congress and their staff. Uh, the things that I've been able to do in the last couple of years and accomplish. And I think about, you know, 14 years ago I crawled out of a garbage can. And I was one of these people that, that was pretty much society had written off. I know recovery is possible. Nobody can tell me any different. I know it is. To order a copy of this program, call 800-999-3534. The preceding program was a production of the National Council of Churches.